Hello and welcome to Network Hour. At this hour, I'm Lyo Olari Day. We have on the program today, 24 hours after a nationwide strike, Nigeria Labour Congress and Trade Union Congress suspend their industrial action. The Nigeria Labour Congress and Trade Union Congress have suspended their strike for five days. This was announced at the end of a joint extraordinary National Economic Council meeting of the two unions in Abuja. Labour had embarked on the strike after negotiations with the federal government on a new minimum wage. The industrial action had paralyzed economic and government activities across the nation on Monday after a six-hour meeting with the leadership of organized labor in Abuja. The federal government expressed the commitment of President Bola Tinumbu to raising the 60,000 naira offered as minimum wage. The tripartite committee resumed its meeting shortly after Labour announced the suspension of the strike. For one week, that was our agreement. And even international conventions, they say you don't, they will say that gone for it. So whether they, they thought that they were negotiating at gone for it or whatever. So we didn't suspend, we relaxed. When our statement comes out, and we relaxed our actions for one week. So, so that we can negotiate. Yesterday's meeting was a kind of mediatory meeting. And then we're going back to the appropriate organ that discusses wages. So we've come, we turn back to status quo and they alone. So the status quo was the 497 and the 60,000. So depending on depending on good faith, you know, we can move up and down to reach an agreement. But if not, another statement. In Sudan, fighting has intensified as both warring parties battle for major cities in the country. In Khartoum, the Sudanese Armed Forces, SAF, released drone footage showing what it says are the rapid support forces withdrawing from, from an area near the capital's Haufaya Bridge amid heavy fighting. According to the SAF, it lost seven soldiers during the offensive while 28 others were injured. The RSF are yet to comment on casualties it sustained in the skirmish, but the group reports that it had repelled an enemy attempt to infiltrate, infiltrate the city of Bari. The RSF maintains control of the eastern side of the Halfaya Bridge, which connects the districts of Bari and Omdurman, while the army controls the western side. Neither has attempted to capture the bridge since July of last year. More than 15,500 people have reportedly been killed in Sudan since the fighting between the SAF and the RSF began in April 2023. Well, joining us now is John Tanza, the managing editor at VOA's English to Africa service and an expert on Sudan. Thank you so much, Mr. Tanza, for your time on our program. Let's begin with the situation on ground. Could you help us understand what living in Sudan is like at this time? The, the fighting that is going on there in the capital of Sudan, that's the city of Khartoum and Omdurman and Bahri, it's it's quite difficult to pinpoint who is having an upper hand and who is withdrawing. These videos are sent by both sides. The RSF is also having their own version of their own video showing that they are in control of uh, Khartoum and they are controlling the strategic uh, facilities there, including bridges. And the Sudan Armed Forces is sending the same. Since it's not easy to get into the town, you know, we are we are all at the mercy of the two belligerent forces who are battling each other in Khartoum. Well, the UN, you know, is saying that famine is imminent in the country, especially because aid is being restricted. What ex specifically, you know, is causing this these restrictions? The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization issued a statement that uh, people trapped inside Khartoum, uh, the Darfur region, 
the Algeria state are uh, those who are at the verge of starvation because Khartoum has been sealed off by RSF uh, fighters. You, you cannot bring anything inside Khartoum, neither can you move outside Khartoum. And uh, the same is happening at uh, Al Jazeera State, which is the breadbasket of Sudan. But people, farmers there have not been cultivating during the rainy season. And in Darfur, it's a different case. The RSF has blocked all routes going in and outside Darfur. And hence, it's not easy to take in the much needed support for families who are trapped there. That's why the, the, the people who are in these areas are at the you know, value of starvation because there's no food. And, uh, you know, w w there have been negotiation talks in recent times, but that has not, you know, brought about any concrete decisions and solutions. There have been several calls for a ceasefire in Sudan, but what is the update at this time with negotiations? The U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, uh, spoke with uh, General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, who is the head of the Sovereign Council and the head of the Sudan Armed Forces. And during the conversation last week, uh, the U.S. Secretary of State asked Burhan to go back to the Jeddah talks. And his deputy, uh, the deputy of uh, General al-Burhan, a gentleman called Malik Agar, was addressing soldiers in Port Sudan right, I mean, two days after the phone call, and he said the military is not going to discuss or negotiate with the, with the RSF. As we speak right now, Malik Agar is in Russia meeting Russian leader uh, Putin asking for, for arms in exchange for Russia's uh, request to build a base at Port Sudan. And it, it's, it just complicates the matter further. It appears like the two belligerent forces are not ready to talk. If you ask the rapid support forces under uh, Hameti, he, he tells you that he is ready to go. But if you ask the other side, the other side will tell you they are not willing to end this crisis and, and this conflict on the table. They want to end it in the battlefield. All right, then. Thank you so much, John Tanza, the managing editor of BOA's English to Africa service in South Sudan. Thank you for your time. My pleasure. We're heading now to South Africa. The Afri Africa National Congress, that's the ruling party, has confirmed that it will hold a national executive committee meeting to be able to decide on the constitution of government this week. The leader, Sir Ramaphosa, seeks a second term but needs the support now of other parties after the ANC lost its majority in parliament. ANC Secretary General Fakile Mbalula announced that the party is having discussions within the organization and with other parties and stakeholders on how best to establish national and provincial governments that will reflect the will of the people and that are able to take the country forward. The country's first party has a range of potential partners, but analysts have warned that no deal would be easy to make. Palestinian officials have applied at the top UN court for permission to join South Africa's case accusing Israel of genocide in Gaza. The request alleges that Israel's ongoing military operation is part of a systemic, systematic effort to wipe Palestinian society and its culture and also social institutions from the map. Well, the request to the International Court of Justice was made on behalf of the State of Palestine and signed by Palestinian Authority Foreign Ministry official Amza Hijazi. South Africa filed its case with the World Court late last year, accusing Israel of breaching the Genocide Convention in its military assault that has laid waste to large swaths of Gaza. Well, Israel has always denied it is commit committing genocide in its military operation to crush Hamas group in Palestine that tr triggered by the deadly October 7 attacks. 
the grandson of Nelson Mandela and a member of South Africa's National Assembly, Nkosi Mandela, is expressing confidence in his country's association with the BRICS Bloc of Nations, viewing it as, as an extension of the ongoing development of relations with Russia. At a news conference in Moscow, Mr. Mandela highlighted what he called Russia's significant role in supporting Pretoria and the broader African continent. He also calls for the suspension of Israel at the International Olympic Committee. According to him, the IOC deemed Russia should be suspended over its war in Ukraine, so Israel should face a similar penalty. But for us as South Africa, we pride ourselves through our liberation movements to have had that relationship with Russia. But also it continued through our transition period and to our new dispensation, uh, the uh, new democratic dispensation, where we have been able uh, to have a, a relationship forged through bilaterals. It was His Excellency uh, President Nelson Kholitla Mandela, my grandfather, who uh, uh, initiated these bilaterals between South Africa and Russia. But we are also proud now that uh, we also uh, are jointly belonging to the BRICS plus family of countries. And uh, in this regard, we are able to uh, forge uh, relations and pursue uh, areas of common interest. We were uh, totally taken aback as South Africans that uh, the IOC was able to uh, suspend and expel Russia from the Olympics over the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict. We have registered to the IOC that uh, through the European Muslim Forum, which uh, I, I'm uh, part of uh, the Global Summit for Palestine Organizing Committee, that uh, this is not an isolated matter. If Russia has been uh, suspended and expelled from Olympics, then we call for the Zionist usurping entity to also be suspended and expelled from the Olympics primarily because they have been uh, found by the International Court of Justice to be carrying out a genocide against the Palestinians. Thank you. Back here in Nigeria, the Lagos State Government says 12,000 feminine products have been distributed to help girls manage their menstrual hygiene appropriately. The State Commissioner for Women Affairs and Poverty Alleviation Cecilia Dada made this comment at the 2024 World Menstrual Hygiene Day at Isheri Olowora, Lagos State. She says the state government will continue to empower women and girls by providing them with the tools and knowledge they need to manage their period safely and confidently. In celebration of the 2024 World Menstrual Hygiene Day, the Lagos State Ministry of Women Affairs and Poverty Alleviation visits some markets in Lagos to distribute female hygiene commodities for women and young girls. From the market, the team moves to Riverine communities in Agboyi and Ilaje to share female hygiene commodities to women in the area. The next port of call is the Skill and Acquisition Center, Isheri Olowora, where students, women, listen carefully to the message on menstrual hygiene. I will advise during the period that we should take plenty of vegetables, we should take plenty of fruits, and a lot of water. When you're on your period, especially for ladies that experience cramps, you take a lot of hot teas. Even if you don't have to, you can just put a lip tea or in hot water and sip it. You will see that your blood will flow better. And it's not all only for people that sees that have brows. It's also good for all for all women actually. 
The State Commissioner for Women Affairs and Poverty Alleviation says government will continue to provide necessary items for women and girls to protect their mental health status. How we must work together to break taboos, beliefs, and silence surrounding menstruation, period reliable and afford menstrual products to those in need and ensure that every female has the knowledge and resource to manage their menstruation in a safe and hygienic manner. Let us empower women and girls by providing them with tools and knowledge they need to manage their period safely and confidently. Women and girls have been asked to protect themselves at all times and practice menstrual hygiene for their own well-being. Continue in Kenya. Exhumations continue in a forest where hundreds of victims of a doomsday cult were found buried last year. Seven more bodies have been discovered. The total number of people on earth from the mass graves now stands at 436. The government had to pause the exhumations last year to allow for DNA matching of the bodies. And so far, only 34 of the victims have been identified. The first bodies were discovered in April 2023 in the Shakahola forest near the Kenyan coast, leading to the arrest of Pastor Paul McKenzie, who is alleged to have led his followers to starve themselves to death. McKenzie has pleaded not guilty to 191 counts of murder, manslaughter and terrorism. He has also been charged with child torture and cruelty. This is a case that shocked the country, a largely Christian nation, and brought attention to the lack of regulation of churches and cults. For more on this, we've been joined now by Kenyan journalist Cyrus Ombati. Hello, Cyrus. Thank you so much for your time on the program. Cyrus, more bodies have been found from the Shakahola forest, reminding Kenyans of this horrific story. What more can you tell us? Well, th thank you for having me in the show. What I can tell you for even today, they covered seven more bodies. It was yesterday, it was seven, today is four, it's seven again. So that brings me four for three bodies which have been covered from the, from the forest. And uh, what we understand is that the bodies are badly composed, so they're, they're, they're just bones which are being uh, exhumed from those shallow graves. And uh, so far, it will take a five, kind of more time to kind of uh, prove who they are or to identify the bodies. Uh, so far, there are many families who are still uh, saying their families are missing, so which will now require them to, to, to submit their DNA samples for sampling here and there. It will take more than time to prove who they are. Indeed, and you know, it's a gory situation. Uh, so far, only 34 of the victims have been identified through DNA, you know, out of over 400. How difficult of a process is this for the government? You see, the problem is that uh, some of these victims who are buried there, they, they went there on their own volition. Some families don't know they went there. Some, uh, some families have not offered their DNA for sampling. So it's, it's a difficult process because uh, there's lack of, first of all, resources. The area is so remote. And people have to transport the bodies from the forest to, to the Malindi town, which is almost 200 kilometers away for, for restoration, then uh, preservation rather than the DNA samples to be picked from the families for, for, comparison, for comparison with the bodies which have been exhumed. So that's why it's taking too long to kind of process the whole uh, bodies which have been uh, identified and uh, exhumed. And so far, we have a number of them which are still pending and identified. And the, the, the local motion authorities are complaining that they are, they are taking up their space in the, which they have in the area. So it's a complex process so far. Indeed. And, you know, you mentioned that many of these victims, their family members, were not even in the know of them going to such places. Perhaps are there talks of compensation or any form of help to, you know, help these family members? No, no, we the government has not mentioned anything of the sort because these are, these are something someone did, did on his own volition. So that it's a cult. It's a belief. People, people believe that they will go to heaven, which is not there. So uh, no one has mentioned the issue of a compensation or the sort of uh, negotiation with the government. Actually, people are being uh, charged with uh, murder, uh, uh, child abuse, uh, all sorts of crimes and terrorism because of these people are dead. So 
there's no one has uh, talked about uh, compensation or the negotiation or have any sort on the same. Talking about those charges against uh, Paul McKenzie, what's the update with his trial? We know he pleaded not guilty to about 199 counts of murder, manslaughter and terrorism. What's the update with his trial? Mackenzie now is a is a is a visitor to court. Uh, virtually, I mean, I can say weekly because uh, because he has uh, so many. Because we find today, this week there is the facing murder. Next week he has a uh, terrorism mention or hearing. The other week he has the issue of child child and molestation or abuse. So the cases are in different stages, and uh, we believe that uh, they will be jailed. You know, Mackenzie and his people will be jailed because uh, even uh, the judges from state they are seeing what's happening. I mean, the prosecution brought, kind of brought a very tight case on um, court. So it will take time, but uh, finally they will be jailed. They currently they are in jail already. Uh, so it will, it will now depend on how, how fast the prosecution will finish their case to enable uh, the judge to make his own uh, verdict on the same. All right, then. Thank you so much, Kenyan journalist Cyrus Sombati. Thank you for your reporting. Okay, so. The United Nations refugee chief, Filippo Grandi, is criticizing the UN Security Council, which is charged with maintaining international peace and security, for failing to use its voice to try to resolve conflicts around the world, from Gaza, Ukraine and Sudan to Congo, Myanmar and many other places. In a hard-hitting speech, Mr. Grandi also accused unnamed countries of making short-sighted foreign policy decisions, which, according to him, is often founded on double standards. The number of people fleeing their homes because of war, violence and persecution has reached 114 million worldwide and Mr. Grandi says that number is increasing because nations have failed to tackle the causes and combatants are refusing to comply with international law. Last year I called on you to use your voice, not your voices. But this council's cacophony has meant that you have instead continued to preside over a broader cacophony of chaos around the world. It is too late for the tens of thousands already killed in Gaza, in Ukraine, in Sudan, in Congo, in Myanmar, and so many other places. But it is not too late to put your focus and energy on the crises and conflicts that remain unresolved so that they are not allowed to fester and explode again. It is not too late to step up help for the millions who have been forcibly displaced to return home voluntarily in safety and with dignity. It is not too late to try and save countless millions more from the scourge of war. Let me add my voice to those who have been urging you to pursue an immediate ceasefire the release of hostages and the full resumption of humanitarian aid. And most importantly, to spare no effort to resurrect a real peace process, the only way to ensure peace and security to Israelis and Palestinians. Rich countries are constantly worrying about what they call irregular movements. But in this and other situations, they're not doing enough to help people before they entrust themselves to human traffickers. The consequences are inevitable. So compliance with international humanitarian law, which of course is an obligation, also has an element of self-interest. In Egypt, President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi has reappointed Prime Minister Mustafa Madbouli to form a new government. Mr. Madbouli earlier on Monday submitted his government's resignation two months after President el-Sisi was sworn in for a third six-year term. It is customary for the government to resign at the start of a fresh presidential mandate. The 58-year-old was first appointed prime minister in June 2018, replacing Sharif Ismail. He had previously served as housing minister since March 2014. He's an architect and urban designer, and in the past had led the United Nations Habitat Regional Office for Arab States. 
Finally, on the program, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov continues his tour in Africa, this time in Congo, holding a meeting with his Congolese counterpart, Jean-Claude Gakoso, at the Oyo airport terminal. Mr. Lavrov was seen warmly greeting the members of the welcome delegation at the aircraft ramp before engaging in a conversation with his Congolese counterpart. Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Zak Zaharkova stated via her Telegram channel that Mr. Lavrov will hold talks with the Republic's leadership in Oyo. Earlier on, he visited Conakry in Guinea, where he held talks with the Foreign Minister Morisanda Kuyate. The discussions reportedly focused on trade, economic, military and technical cooperation between both countries, as well as coordination of actions on the international stage. And that's it on the program. Thank you for watching. I'm Layo Olarindi.